And we're really lucky to have Teresa Rosano and Luis Abarro here tonight um, with Abarro Rosano. Um, they're from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Teresa is a registered architect in Arizona, and they're native Tucsonians and graduates of the University of Arizona College of Architecture. In 1999, they founded Abarro Rosano Design Architects and have since earned national recognition as one of Arizona's top design firms for their modern design architecture. Their work has been public internationally and has received over 50 regional and national design awards. They were selected by Architecture Magazine as one of the nine firms to represent their state in its issue on the Arizona School, and their work was exhibited at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in its architecture and design show featuring works of six firms based in the southern region. They were honored with the Residential Architects Rising Star National Leadership Award in 2008 and were recently included among 50 international firms for their raw 50 short list of architects we love for their body of work to date. Architecture is space. This is a basic premise of their work and they are committed to belief in the power of space to nurture and inspire. They believe the goal of design is to create a structure that lasts, not just for the quality of construction, but also by the timeless beauty of its design. An architecture that is informed by the past, responsive to the present, and aware of the future. And with that, I'd like to um, welcome, welcome Trace and Lewis. Thank you very much, Amy, and also thank you, Eric, for taking us around today and um, letting us talk to your class. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, also, it's, it's a real honor to be included in this lecture series uh, among the other architects, some of whom are our friends, others whose work we admire. Um, so it's a real honor to be talking to you and included among this group. Okay, I'm going to start with the, uh, a quote by Glenn Market. He says, Our role as architects is that of the discoverer. Uh, any work of architecture that exists, any work of architecture that has the potential to exist, uh, is there to be discovered, uh, not there to be created. Uh, so this, this quote from Glenn Market is, very much describes the process of our design and uh, our our work is born out of sight through a process of discovery. Uh, it was kind of interesting to be working on our lecture in which uh, sight plays such a, um, and connection to sight plays such a, a key role um, sitting in some of the spaces here in Las Vegas where it's almost um, contrary to the site. It's about taking you somewhere different. So that was kind of an interesting experience. Um, so what we'll be doing is uh, going through uh, six projects, um, three residences, uh, two installations, and then one more, our most recent residence, um, to try to illustrate this idea. Uh, the relationship to the site, um, we hopefully will be uh, more obvious with the residences, um, but it's even true for the installations. Um, for both the physical side of the gallery itself, but then also uh, the regions and the landscapes that the installations are about. So uh, Luis and I are going to tag team this lecture, and so uh, now he's it. Okay. Well, thanks for having us. I also want to uh, thank everybody for uh, being so kind to us and bringing us here to speak to you this evening. Um, we, uh, in order to keep, we got 149 slides. I'll try to go fairly quickly through them, but in order to do so, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna be going off a script. Uh, but uh, along the way, if you have any questions, just shout them out, shout, shout them out uh, and uh, we'll try to answer them and, and then uh, keep this thing going for you. Um, one, first time we were asked to speak about our work, uh, to put together a lecture, it was a very interesting and odd proposition because, um, we weren't really ready to do a lecture. We didn't quite know exactly what we did and why it was worth talking about, uh, what was interesting about it. Uh, but it was a really good exercise because in the process we came to recognize that there are several themes that lie at the center of our thinking and our approach to making space. And um, so 
the way uh, we like to begin our presentations is by speaking of this idea of simple shelters. Um, and that's, this is what we've concluded, one of the strongest factors of, of how we approach our work. Uh, Teresa and I have an admiration for this approach that we call simple shelters. Uh, by our definition, these are places that are born out of solving problems very directly. Uh, it's the idea of making extraordinary spaces from ordinary materials and apply logic and practicality to such a degree that it surpasses that pragmatism to become art. Often, uh, these are done by untrained designers whose aim is to solve a problem very directly that of dwelling, uh, but do so purely and simply, so, so much so that they transcend that, uh, the prosaic and, and move into that which we consider poetic. And this is the way of building that, that really inspires us. The structure in this photo was originally a chicken coop. It sits on the edge of a neighborhood landfill from which the construction materials were salvaged. It is a simple shelter across the border and uh, the Mexican side of Nogales. The photo shows the ingenuity and resourcefulness of people who creatively adapt to circumstance. These simple shelters possess a clarity in living and demonstrate a love for life and future. And future. Many of these kinds of spaces are embedded in my subconscious, but this one in particular, I visited several times as I was growing up. At about nine feet by nine feet or 10 feet by 10 feet, this uh, former chicken coop was my mom's early childhood home, where she lived with her mom and her two uncles until she was three. The, the point of sharing this with you is not so much, or not at all really, about talking about poverty and, and these poor structures. On the contrary, the point of sharing this with you is that I learned great lessons at an early age from these simple shelters. Lessons about resourcefulness, efficiency, simplicity, and honesty of materials and construction. And those are the values, those are the metrics by which we, we measure our work. That chicken coop was eventually replaced paycheck to paycheck. That's the builder of both the chicken coop, my, my uh, mom's uncle, and then this house, uh, which I grew to know as my grandmother's house. It's a multi-generational, multi-family house for uh, my family in, in Nogales. This house grew as the family grew to become the neighborhood's favorite place to be. On Christmas and New Year's, that neighborhood would flood this house with dancing and drinking and eating and singing all night. It's, as our friend Glenn Merkett says it, it's about the ings of things, the living, the dreaming, and the sharing, the reasons for architecture in the first place. It's these special places that we aim to create because we realize that it's these stories that we sometimes barely remember but those stories leave an indelible mark in each one of us. And it's those marks that make their way into your views about people, about place, and about the work you do. Simple shelters are simple, but not naive. They're rooted, they're experimental, but not unstudied. Rooted in problem solving, but not artless. It's how you make the most with the least to make it important places. As you might suspect, this is Teresa and her mom sitting in their living room which will eventually become in their living room. Those blocks are made by your father's hands of desert dirt. Back in the day when an adobe house was not only socially unacceptable, but in fact it was illegal by the recently adopted code. Teresa saw this place literally grow out of the earth. She learned respect for the land and her childhood is rooted in the desert playing amongst the thorns and the dust. In this house, the good spiders occupied the, 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 the I'm sorry, the good spiders occupied the corners while the mean spiders were escorted out. And we're fascinated by this ability that architecture has to redefine the world around us, to make special places that live in our hearts and in our minds, places that encourage us to make connections between our bodies and the, the bodies of cactus, between our skin and the warmth of the sun. These places where we connect notions of home with the smell of creosote on a rainy day, and of course making soap bubbles in the rain left behind. For us, architecture is about space, not object. The magic is in the manipulation of experience and not the form. We see architecture not as habitable sculpture, but about inhabiting time, as in this photo. I would consider this the most wonderful architecture for miles, but it's not the shape of the tree, 
as an object, but the shade and the shelter that it provides, the presence of moisture and oxygen that it creates, the feel of the sap, the smell of the leaves, the sound of the cicadas and the, and the, and the leaves that rustle in its branches. It's in that sense of hope and refuge where all things thrive and even in the vast emptiness that surrounds it and reinforces the specialness of it all. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show you some work and see if those things I said are evident. Hopefully they are. And if not, ask me some questions. Maybe I can clarify. We began our practice in 1999, and a friend of a friend of ours called us up because we had won uh, another award for a remodel of our own kitchen. And that caught his attention, and he hired us, asked us to do a, uh, a home for him. Uh, he wanted a desert-appropriate house uh, on, a, on a lot that he found that he asked us to come see. He was a med student in Baltimore, and he really liked the space that he lived there. It was a loft space that he really liked. Uh, when he was living there. But as you can see, the site is nothing like Baltimore. It's a north-facing slope in the Tucson mountain range. It's, the mountain is basically solid rock. Uh, so we knew the excavation would be both difficult and expensive. Um, so we spent a great deal of time on the site, and this is kind of key to how we operate, uh, measuring and document everything that we feel, which takes a little while to understand the topography, the steepness of the site, the view shed, the sight lines, plant diversity, animal crossings, wind, water patterns, solar angles, and so on. There's a lot to really learn about a site. And we, fully, we believe, fully believe that uh, designs are really born of site. And that's a, a big thing that I think I we want to share with you this evening, uh, how, how, how that happens for us. Because we believe that it's those forces that inform our process and inform the design. But the most important thing to do is to sit still on the site, because when you do, lessons emerge and patterns appear. Like the modulation of and growth of the ubiquitous prickly pear, it follows purposeful patterns. Each pad is oriented to deal with the sun by self-shading, to produce food, to resist the winds, to balance its mass, to create habitat for other creatures. And when you look at it that way, this kind of meaningless plant actually is quite beautiful. In this case, the house, the Garcia house, besides holding up the roof, the placement of the walls is also very deliberate to eliminate views, to dissolve the plan by breaking the corners, to take advantage of the prevailing breezes, to modulate for the solar angles, to frame uh, things in the landscape, and so on. Our solution to this house on this very steep site was to parallel the house plan to the contours, to terrace the program to three long, narrow bays, the living in a kitchen and dining on the here on the lowest level, and then an entry spine down the middle, and then the sleeping areas are up on the top. This strategy kept the building mass and excavation to a minimum, while at the same time optimizing for solar exposure. This is south over here, so sun comes in, as do the breezes as they fall in the evening, they kind of flush the house out uh, in, the, in the afternoon, right before going to bed. Because of the bareness and hardness of the land, we worried that the structure would loom, loom imposingly on the landscape and of course, we wanted it to, to appear to just simply grow out of the hillside. So since people move uh, vertically much more easily than cars do, we realized that the flat part of the site we should dedicate to the cars and the septic system. And then we conceived of a man-made rock formation, a habitable rock outcropping where the planes of masonry are deliberately interrupted by vertical and horizontal fractures. That's hard to see here. Oh, well. Uh, the arrival point of the spine of the house is conceived as a tube-like space, that's this here, uh, that's open on either end, which frames the desert, channels the breezes, and draws the inside out and outside in, vice versa. Uh, it's a very, it was a very tight budget, so we kept the materials very simple, very ordinary materials. It's just simply concrete block, steel, and glass. Uh, the gray blocks uh, blurs the distinction between the inside and the outside, and the block gives a sense of permanence and, and belonging to the site. Now, if you can accept that architecture is about space, then every project is really a remodel. There's no such thing as a blank slate. Uh, so the question before us is, how do you amplify the energy and the spirit of the space that's already there without spoiling it? Here the materials are modest and the spaces are of basic construction. The house is intended to be as raw 
and as rugged as the land that it sits on. It's about inhabiting the desert in a way that maintains the qualities of the original site and yet allows somebody to feel very much at home. We treat space the way a sculptor might a slab of stone. Every physical insertion is considered first as a spatial response. In other words, we're sculpting space with object, space with form. But it's not about self-expression. It's more about expressing the problem. We like to think that uh, what we're making is a piece of a larger puzzle that in the way, that in the end could fit no other way. When the house was under construction, Teresa and I would visit it on the weekends and, and we'd find that the, the construction workers were there also sharing it with their friends. And, and that is for us a, a very cool thing to be a part of when other people can engage with the work and, and to make it their own. This idea of making connections between uh, people and the land, and between uh, new spaces and, and the ancient ancient spaces. We also love things that express the why of what they are. When you look closely at the agave, you see the imprint of its growth. It's a tracery of how this plant has adapted and developed over the centuries. Its shape is poised to gather rain, protect its tender flesh. It's about efficiency. It's about protection. It tells a story, and that story makes sense. This undeniable view is uh, facing west, so we kept the opening very small and it actually uh, is in the laundry room. And from there, you can, you can see back to the car. This is a garage, or not the carport, and then the, the mountainside. This is the spine of the house. Uh, bedrooms up on the, on the left here. This is a courtyard little space I'll show you in a minute. And then it's a very simple plan. Uh, it's the kitchen, uh, the dining, and the living room. A connection that you saw before to the mountain on the one side, and then saguaro on the opposite. And that's a uh, view sitting in the in the uh, living rooms, and that's the view from the outside. And uh, it, we actually have added on to this house recently, but we don't have any photos, so we didn't bring them with us. But what was really cool back when it was, there was there's now a little uh, deck out here because the client wanted to come out. But what was cool before is that the javelina would come in and just, just wander in and put their noses through the glass to see what the humans were doing inside the diorama. So that was really cool. Uh, we were asked, uh, soon after it was done, the client got married, uh, which we thought what might be, actually, we found out uh, he was engaged when the project was under, almost done with the design, uh, actually almost done with the construction doc documents. And then we found out he was engaged and she was going to be introduced to the project, so we thought it was going to be a, a disaster and everything was going to get torn up and redone. And Luckily, no, she was very much on board, and she says, well, I really want a pool. And we said, well, we had a pool in the beginning, but uh, we, it got cut of the budget. She says, I'm paying for the pool. And th so th actually, that happened after we, we were already done, because at that point, we started building it. And so then she said, well, I might want a pool down the road. So okay. So we, this is a, a view of the pool. It, it's on its axis with that, that uh, entry spine here. Uh, it's not working right now. Anyway. You can see the entry spine and the pool is in ax on axis with that. So the cool relationship is that on this lower deck, you can put your elbow on the pool, you have a pool fence uh, or a safety edge, and then you can just have a conversation with somebody that's swimming in the pool. Um, there's a view back the other direction. Since the majority of the house faces north, we split the bedrooms uh, to allow winter sun to come and hit the interior spaces and activate them. Uh, Northern light is, is much more stale, stale or still, or both. And whereas the southern sun really is much, a little more active. Uh, one of the things about making this little courtyard space is we allow the sun to come in, and uh, as well as the breezes to fall through. And also, uh, the way that the desert is bold but sparing with the use of color, we broke with the gray block, in this case, to surprise uh, guests and uh, with, the, with a little punch of color in it a little surprise in the, in the courtyard. This is an early entry sketch. They're all kind of washed out, sorry about that. Uh, and then the final outcome. The, the goal of showing you this is, is not so much about sculpture or self-expression. It's necessity that motivates each of these resolutions. Everything in the building is an answer to the problem. Every decision is, made on, is, is based on something important. And we trust that inherent in this approach lies time and, and beauty. So this project is very near the previous one, but you can see that the vegetation and the geology is actually quite different. Um, the site is speckled with saguaro. Uh, 
And they were, in fact, the guiding force behind the design, uh, not just because we had to dance around them to save them, but because they spoke to us about the site. Um, you can see the lines and notes we made on the survey. Um, so this is really a record of the conversation that we had uh, with them, as if, almost as if they were lining up um, with each other to help us understand the context. Um, and then those lines became the vectors for the building's layout. So the Downing residence is comprised of three pavilions of masonry, rusted steel, and glass. And the material hues and textures were chosen in response to the landscape, much like the Garcia residence. And then each pavilion steps carefully between the saguaro um, along the undulating topography. So just as the vegetation follows purposeful patterns, uh, so does this plan. So each orientation is in direct response to the sun, the wind, the topography, and to the views. So the three pavilions climb up the hill in clockwise rotation um, from public to private. Um, so the, the living, uh, dining kitchen, the um, garage with two bedrooms above, and the master, um, master suite. So the, this is the, the two bedrooms that stack on top of that. And so each of those pavilions is um, separated. The, um, this is the, the, the entry that is uh, between the living and the two-story mass. And then this is the, this has a funny story behind it. Um, we, it's not technically a bridge. It, it's not, there's not space underneath it, but it's, it's bridging between two, uh, two volumes. And we didn't want to call it a hall because we have a hall upstairs. So part of that was just um, calling it a bridge so that it was very clear you know, with the contractor. But, uh, but I went down to the zoning counter. And uh, you know how that's always fun, right? Going down to the zoning counter. So I went down, I took the, took the drawings, and they said, it was a, um, a young man, he said, ooh, you, you can't call it a bridge uh, because a bridge has a very specific definition and um, you can't have a bridge on this site. And I said, oh, okay, well, I can, but I can call it something else. And he said, um, yeah, you just need to call it something else. So I wrote right above bridge, not A. And so he was very silent for a moment. And he said, um, I don't, you can't call it that. And I said, well, I said, that's the name of the room now. And he said, oh, well, hold on, J just a minute. And he, he went back into the kind of the back room of behind the zoning counter and disappeared for about five minutes. And he came back and he sighed. He said, okay, you can call it that. <laughs> and so, but what's funny is that um, it became known as not a bridge throughout the entire project and there was never, uh, never any question about you know, what space we were talking about. So then the other space between the, the two masses of the, the living and the garage um, here. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, so this is, this is kind of a, a crevice that you enter between the two, um, between the two volumes. And the house is really about um, movement on the site. So it's about those trails that we made as we spent time studying the movement on the land. And then those trails um, translated into habitable space. Mm -hmm. So here's the entry. And um, when you come in, you see back out. And so for us, uh, the best solutions are ones that work on multiple levels. Um, so for seismic reasons, we had to separate these two dissimilar masses because one was one story and one was two story. And uh, they would move around differently in, um, in seismic activity. Uh, so what we did is it, we exploited this structural necessity um, and turned it into a skylight. So that washes the entry with sunlight. Um, and it creates a light sculpture that changes throughout the day and throughout the seasons.
And so these, um, like the last project, are actually very inexpensive materials. Um, uh, shop birch plywood for most of the cabinets, and then a uh, little bit of mesquite, which is found locally. And on the right, you can see some of the work um, that goes into making these things happen. And a concept, uh, concept sketch of the powder room and the finished space. So the idea here is to connect uh, water and its use uh, with the preciousness um, in the desert beyond, and so hopefully inspire conservation. And there's that space seen from the outside. Oops. And uh, so the, the materials are, are chosen to, um, for their durability and to forge a kinship with the site. So hopefully you can see that our design approach is, is a search for the inevitable, um, reducing elements to their essence but, that, but without being preoccupied with minimalism. So it's a push toward a solution um, that begins with an unbiased investigation of the problem uh, where we're being patient enough um, to listen to the natural forces, uh, then we find answers. So then on this project, um, we had to ask, how do you apply these same ideas about space and connecting to nature uh, where the land has already been damaged? And the winter residence is a remodel that asked that question. So our strategy was to simplify and amplify what was already there, uh, simplifying by eliminating non-contributing elements uh, and amplifying the redeeming qualities of the original house. So the one good thing about this house that was sitting on the hill was that it was oriented correctly uh, for the sun and also for the view. Um, but the thing that, that didn't work was that um, it was, the original entrance was up a, a steep driveway right here. And, um, and so you had to, uh, or here's the original entrance, but you, there was a steep driveway this way and so you'd park over here and then have to go up these kind of broken step, come back around and come up these broken steps to the entrance. And so actually the door people used was this one um, because it made more sense. That's where you parked, you left your car, um, and it's on the way to the kitchen. Uh, you didn't have to deal with the steps. So rather than fight with this living pattern, uh, we worked with it. Um, so we gave dignity to what was really only a utilitarian entrance. And we did so by pulling the cars away, uh, layering the spaces with new ones, and then creating courtyards behind simple patio walls. So these are simple screens made of steel stud tracks uh, and masonry site walls, and they shelter the house from the western sun and also amplify the horizontal aspect of the house. And then we made uh, better use of the old entrance. Uh, by abandoning the steps and then creating a simple refuge, uh, and then added shade and insulation in the process. So now the, the house uh, sits uh, low and horizontal on the lot, um, conceptually with the light and spatial qualities of a cloud resting on a hill. So this is when we first arrived. Um, the house was very dark and disconnected from its site, and the main room was split uh, by an awkwardly placed fireplace and um, bisecting wall. So here was the, the fireplace was here and there were cabinets flanking it. And this split the, split the two rooms. Um, but so by re, uh, removing that, we connected the inside to the outside and then the front with the back of the house. So here you can see the fireplace crowding the front front door and cutting off light to the other half of the room. So we were able to reunite the space into a more inviting and calming place to be and improve the light quality. So this, uh, this skylight, it was where the, the fireplace once was. So this was another heavily partitioned room that failed to take advantage of, a, um, of the great clear story light um, and view opportunities. So the, the shower and the toilet are actually in the same spot. Um, 
But the shower curtain is actually available on eBay if anyone is interested. No? The, the new vanity is a floating vessel that marries the wet and the dry areas with the wood and the glass, um, the dressing and the bathing. And so when you work with space as a medium, uh, it's difficult to design a window without knowing what will be on, the, what will be on either side, um, and difficult to create a space without knowing what it will contain. Uh, so, and because space is a continuum, we've been designing our own landscapes and our own interiors. Uh, and unlike working with form, which is finite, space is unending. Uh, but it's informed by the objects, the textures, the color, the light, and the temperatures contained within it. So it's about the manipulation of space, um, not form, experience, rather than object. Um, and then here, going back outside, we have the typical stereo, uh, stereotypical kidney bean pool. Uh, and it was really strangled by this patio wall. So not only was it kind of poorly conceived to begin with, it was um, made really impractical by the ever-crowding house expansions that it, that it occurred over the years. So ironically, what we did was bring it even closer to the house. Uh, but now, instead of being a barrier that, between the house and the rest of the site, the new pool invites you outdoors and reconnects the owners to the land. And it, uh, the pool organizes the backyard into two distinct zones, the uh, warm deck outside the master suite and the cool deck that links to the living spaces. So we aimed at the light qualities of a cloud resting on a hill, uh, where harmony, serenity, and simplicity were the key ingredients of the remodel. Um, now this project is admittedly a world away from a, uh, from a chicken coop. But the building logic and creative thinking are the same. So we're not advocating for abnegation or Spartan way of living, but rather a search for purpose and for meaning. And we feel that timelessness is attained when every decision is based on something important and when space is given as much consideration as the objects. So a, um, a few years after we had finished that house, and this seems to be a recurring theme where um, we have clients who then have um, children and then want to expand. And that's what happened here. Um, they wanted to create an enclosed space for their children to play. Um, but this was a challenge because the only opportune spot was right in front, uh, and we risked spoiling the work that we had already done. So we tried to create a space with just a few bold gestures to spark creativity. Uh, it's about creating a framework for the imagination, but without getting in the way. Um, a line of concrete, a shaded cube, a grassy patch, uh, a wall, and two little boys. So our aim was to create a place for running, jumping, hiding, writing, imagining, pretending, growing, learning. A place where play was taken seriously enough to be fun. But we also recognized that a space like this needs to eventually grow up um, because children change and their ideas of play change. So it needed to become a space that would serve the needs of toddlers, teenagers, um, adolescents and grown-ups alike. Uh, and the, the problem with it, adults is that we forget how to play. And we tend to believe that play is only found in bright colored plastic contraptions that resemble adult stuff. But really play is about imagination and about soaring in the possibilities of the impossible. Uh, so our, our aim was to create a space for filling, um, filling with the joy of laughter, with the sparks of pretending, um, with the pattern of running and jumping. So this 10-foot cube uh, sits like a toy block, hanging on the edge, um, hovering above the desert floor. Uh, one day it's a store, another a boat, uh, another a spaceship, a nest, or a cave. And then as the sun sets, it wonders what it will get to be tomorrow. So this is uh, backing up a little bit. In uh, 2003, shortly after our first project, the Garcia Residence was published, 
Uh, our work caught the attentions of the curators at the uh, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, SMOCA. And we were ex um, selected to exhibit our work in a regional show uh, together with other architects and graphic designers. And we'd been, so we've been talking about how a design arises from the site. So even to some extent it's true here, even in kind of the, the supposed blank slate of a gallery space. Um, so we had the need to uh, flat pack our exhibit and transport it in a car and put it up quickly. And so our site really was this wall and a, a concrete floor with um, a couple control, control joints. So this was our, um, the flat pack and then the exhibit itself. Mm -hmm. So then that opportunity led to a commission for an exhibit that was completed in 2007. Uh, and it's an, it's an installation about an issue that continues to be very relevant, especially in our part of the country. Uh, the Border Film Project is a collaboration between three friends, um, Brett Honeycutt, Victoria Criado, and Rudy Adler. And they spent a summer traveling along the U.S.-Mexico border. And they devised a plan to di distribute disposable cameras uh, to the migrants who intended to cross the border into the United States and to the self-appointed Minutemen who report that activity along the border. So the purpose of their experiment was to document the uh, untold human story and disseminate the material without personal bias. So the Border Film Project uh, was about the human condition, not about politi political rhetoric, of which there is um, plenty and continues to be. So we were um, asked to design the installation. Um, so we designed that with um, the exhibition itself with varying contrasts and ambience um, in order to evoke a contemplative state within the viewer. And the intent is to encourage people to leave their preconceptions at the door um, and allow the exhibit to shed light on topics not covered by the agenda-driven media. So the main concept of the installation is based on the literal and metaphoric presence of shadows uh, connected to the border and and to illegal immigration. Literally, the concept represents the, color, the cover of moonlight. It cloaks the footsteps of men and women that step blindly into shadows in search of a better life. And it's also about those who choose to sit in those same shadows to shed light on the symptom of a growing problem. And symbolically, it represents the shadows of society where migrants enter and try to live their lives living in the shadow of, um, of a great nation, of a very powerful force. And it's, a, it's about the shadow cast by ignorance and fear on both sides that shrouds, shrouds the truth. So the large gallery space is um, altered to create a, a journey through three concentric spaces. Uh, the outermost space is dark and uncomfortable, and the direction is not clear, and neither is the motive. Um, two uh, low-frequency, dissonant tones um, think, thicken the tension of the space, and a dark floating volume sits out of square, twisting to conceal the entrances to the light, uh, which spills out under the, the dark floating walls um, that... Uh, uh, are casting shadows of bodies uh, moving along the floor. The walls are um, painted a very dark brown, and on them the quotes are hand-lettered uh, in the unheard voices of migrants and Minutemen side by side, in contrast or in agreement, and in both English and Spanish. And then once inside, the space is bright, and the once shadowy figures are uh, revealed to be fellow museum patrons. Um, and here the photographs are displayed. And in this space, a third tone melds with the other two and dissidence is partly resolved. The third innermost space is a tall, narrow passage, um, like a beacon or a lantern. It's the projection room where the border uh, participants are presented, um, sharing their human needs and trials 
uh, in a brief film documentary. And here, the space and hopefully the visitor are illuminated. Okay, so um, getting back to site, um, this is a project that we don't normally talk about. Uh, it's actually a competition that we were invited to be in, also by the Scott Still Museum of Contemporary Art. I guess we don't show it because we didn't win, but um, we thought we'd share it with you because it does have uh, something to do with site, and it actually expands the topic of site to a, a larger scale, that of the urban, um, the urban domain, the size, you know, more talking about cities. And Teresa and I have been very interested in, in that uh, for a while actually because of Tucson's uh, development patterns and, and opportunities that we see in Tucson. So the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art in, together with well, there was some another sponsor or something, but anyway, so they invited uh, 20 firms of which we were one from across the country to, to reconsider the, the strip mall. What, is, what can we do with the strip mall? And of course, we had already had a lot of thoughts about that because living in Tucson, strip malls are ubiquitous as they are anywhere in the western part of the country. And uh, so we had a bunch of ideas of, of what to do. Um, but the challenge for us was that we only got one little piece of it. So what can you do with just one little piece of, of this uh, paradigm? Um, certainly, you can only affect that much of it. And so we were really struggling in the beginning because we just thought, well, that's not really going to work. A lot of it has to do with policy. A lot of it has to do with little, large, broader range thinking and, and just one lot is not really going to be, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do with that. And of course we thought about, in this, in this frustration, we thought about just quitting the commission or uh, going ahead and just redesigning the whole street, but of course all of that didn't quite make sense. And so we, we took it as a challenge to ask ourselves uh, to, re to really look at our process and see if, if the things that we uh, have been talking to you today about apply to something at this uh, scale and with this particular program. Um, so uh, Phoenix and Tucson are very different in that Phoenix is much more uh, spread out. Uh, there's a lot, it's a lot more like Las Vegas where there's big empty spaces between buildings and larger buildings. Tucson is, is hemmed or, or held in by the mountains that surround it, so it, it has a limitation to a certain degree. Um, but uh, so we, all of our ideas from Tucson didn't seem to apply to Phoenix. Um, so what we did is uh, we started to question, uh, ask ourselves a series of questions, cynically actually, to be honest with you. But uh, so we asked ourselves that perhaps it's not the ubiquitous and insipid, uh, it's not that the ubiquitous and insipid strip malls that hem this uh, suburban grid have gone too far. Perhaps it's that they haven't gone far enough. If the strip mall was ever the most efficient and convenient way to shop, is it still? Aesthetic debates aside, is, is the strip mall all that it can be? If a shortened walk from the car to the store's front door is the strip mall's vir ultimate virtue, then why would we walk at all? For that matter, why should we ever leave the car to do anything? We learn, to, we learn from a very early age that we have a God-given right to drive wherever we want, and that combined with our latest trend to instant access by way of an inter, uh, internet and cell phone, which is also our God-given right. So our, our submission was born out of this tongue-in-cheek critique of car culture and Western ideas about driving, convenience, and segregated land use. Uh, today, we shop online, we bank online, we work online, we even have sex online, we probably can even die online. What if we were to combine this recent cultural opportunity in how we socialize and interface and apply it to a now stagnant uh, evolution of, of the strip mall. Maybe the internet, uh, the interconnectedness is what affords us this new opportunity to revive and reimagine this tired infrastructure and respond to new consumer demand. If car convenience is our culture's metric for success, then it seems only responsible to work within this new cultural framework. So that self-probing uh, series of questions began to morph into a proposal which stands now, we think, stands somewhere between futuristic exaggeration and a potentially viable solution. So here's what we did. We took a look at a strip mall near our house. And this is actually a much bigger lot than, than the one that we were asked to in Phoenix. 
Uh, this contains a supermarket, and you guys all know the supermarket scale strip mall. Um, and it contains these six stores, a few others, but those are the big ones. Um, and so our idea is, by analyzing this, we, we wanted to see what can we do to, to condense this inefficient and ineffective way of uh, selling things. Um, so financially, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, the big box re retailers must provide space for bumbling shoppers to make their way down inefficient merchandise aisles toward awkward checkout stands. Vast amounts of space, uh, energy, resources, air conditioning, money are consumed by these brightly lit places, pumped with expensive cooling and plastered with ineffective graphics. Um, the limit of human reach makes the majority of this interior, the heights here, not of much use. So in a nutshell, what we, what we proposed is uh, the automated uh, drive-through strip mall, actually an automated uh, drive-through supermarket and everything else. We counted all the SKUs in the, in the stores and uh, all the different kind of types of product that were being sold there. And we figured out, that helps us to figure out how much space we needed for, for this design. And so we figured that if we could squeeze all of that empty and useless space out of it, including the parking and the space that nobody can reach that is just there for ambience, I suppose, uh, that we could maybe achieve a greater efficiency. So here you see the, the paradigm shift. This is a typical strip mall, like the one that's near our house. And so what we realized is we can take all of this uh, area and make it a, a vertical by way of, here's a, the typical uh, idea where everything is limited by human reach. Here we devised uh, a series of cute little robots that go shopping for you. Uh, and so with that little bit of um, science fiction, we came up with this, de this design that uh, we found that actually we could increase by 600% the, the sales that we could get on that little strip mall. So we could sell a lot more by way of this uh, crazy design. Um, so we replaced the shoppers with, with robots. Uh, and the checkout stands with internet, virtual internet uh, storefronts uh, to achieve greater efficiency and consumer convenience. The robots essentially go shopping as soon as you place your order online. And um, so that's kind of just proof that we worked out a bunch of stuff. I won't get into that, but effectively uh, you click, um, you zip your card or you, you pay for the, the stuff online, get in your car, you pop the hood, it all comes, it's already ready for you by the time you get there because it's, it's that good. Um, anyway, so this is one of our boards. Um, it has also a grocery component to it. Um, that actually didn't work so well because the groceries are a little more tricky, but we still had that as part of it. Um, Anyway, so I just thought it might be interesting to take a look at this crazy idea that we had at one point. Uh, but you, we even considered the fact that this was going to be so successful that uh, people would come here and park and, and take their kids through these tours where they could see the robots. And, and the robots are over here. And uh, that was that. We didn't win, but uh, it was a fun it was a fun exercise nonetheless. Um, I think now we're going to just close with our last, uh, the house, the most recent house that we just finished, um, and I'll let Teresa do that. Okay, so this um, this house, uh, again, like the other uh, projects, responds to a lot of the things we've talked about in terms of the site. Um, so this, this site um, slopes toward the west um, into a wash. This is very light. So this is the wash. And then the, the site is actually bifurcated by um, kind of a tributary wash. Um, so it basically splits this buildable area, which is here, which is set by the HOA, it splits that in half. Um, and so the best, the best views are really to the southeast and to the, uh, to the south to the city and to the north. Uh, the, the west has great views as well, but um, it has these future home sites that would be right in the way. And then, of course, the west is also the most harsh sun exposure. So those were some of the, the factors that we were looking at. Uh, so the, the organization is, is simple. It's the, the parking area. Wow, 
next slide. Um, here's the parking area. Um, the wash is coming through here. Uh, the main living and master linked by, uh, this really is a bridge, um, to, the, uh, uh, to the bedrooms, to the, the guest bedrooms. So three rectangular tubes um, with the car court opening to the sky and then the living volumes opening to the north and to the south. So this is almost the opposite of how we approach the Garcia residence. Um, there the volumes are running parallel to the contours. Uh, but here, in order to achieve the best solar orientation and also have a, a single level for the clients who plan to retire here, we ran the house perpendicular to the topography. So the floor starts tangent to the earth at the east end uh, and remains level as the land slopes downward, um, leaving the floor floating above the desert. Uh, and so a part of that was so that we wouldn't be um, towering above the site on this, on this side, which is... Um, kind of how um, people perceive the house. And this, uh, this space that's, this space actually uh, creates a shady habitat for desert animals. Um, the same, uh, well, not the same ones, but the same species, uh, the javelina that would come to the Garcia residence and kind of peek in the window. Um, we see javelina under, under here, and we see their prints there all the time, so they're down there getting, uh, getting some shade. And, uh, pardon and deer and other animals um, go down there. And in fact, uh, as the house was being built, this is where everybody ate lunch, all the workers ate lunch. And so, um, so for these uh, structural post-tension slabs, in order to do that, um, we have a, a great structural engineer uh, right there, um, Mike Harris, who um, we had a, a contractor who wasn't uh, familiar with structural post-tension slabs. And so having Mike um, on site was, was a, a great thing. Uh, so the, the use of the cantilevered slabs is, uh, is not so much about it being sculptural, dramatic, but it's actually a, a nature preservation move. It's a, a solar orientation move um, and also universal accessibility. Uh, and so here's the, the bridge that links the cars to the house, um, which is also uh, which is also a post-tensioned cantilevered slab that's held just away from the house um, to allow for um, expansion and differential movement. So there's a sketch of the entry bridge, an early sketch, and then the final. And here's some, some of the detailing that went into that. So uh, because this is for a couple with grown daughters, um, uh, who are starting families, um, the idea was to break the house into smaller pavilions. Uh, so the, the main, uh, in this space, you see the, the, the living wing and the master bedroom is over here. And uh, so that's split away from the, the, guest, um, the guest rooms so that the house can be um, shut down when it's just the couple or um, all of it used when it's the whole family. Um, so they're able to save energy. And that strategy of breaking it apart um, also allows both of those pavilions to open to both the north and the south and um, provide cross ventilation through them and transparency um, for views. So that, that library that bridges between the two pavilions um, really kind of shelters an outdoor room um, from the harsh western sun and also from those future, um, future houses on the west. Um, but it still allows a it still allows a view of those uh, those near mountains, just the top of them, uh, that provides a backdrop to the fireplace wall. And so, doing that provides an outdoor space um, that's shielded from future neighbors, uh, but it still opens very much to the landscape. And here's the library bridge. Um, there's in it just a very narrow view to the west, just enough to capture the top of the mountains. And the, uh, the idea of the uh, living dining kitchen was to keep it very um, open and transparent, um, but have the kitchen screened while still being connected. And so, um, 
part of this idea of collapsibility is um, in, the, in the kitchen itself um, and then also throughout the house in terms of how it's planned. Um, actually, this, um, this kitchen just uh, won a regional award um, for Sub-Zero Wolf. And so they took us to Santa Barbara and um, uh, we went wine tasting and um, got massages, got to be on the beach. So that was really fun. And then in, um, in May, they're taking us to Madison, Wisconsin, where the, they'll be selecting the national winner. So, so hopefully. Um, and so this, the, the whole house is uh, really um, conceptually like a photographer's cropping out, um, the tool that photographers used to use with the idea that it frames the, uh, frames the landscape into more understandable experiences and, and vignettes. So the openings are very deliberate. Um, larger openings on the north and the south with overhangs to protect them. Um, minimal openings on the east and the west. Um, these, these slots um, frame, the vertical slots frame um, saguaro and then the the horizontals capture that ridge. So keeping the east and west um, very minimal in terms of openings. And actually, in, when we first met um, with the clients on the site, they didn't really think they had a city view. They, they knew they had plenty of mountain view, but they said, well, we don't really think we have that much of a city view, so it's probably not you know, really worth um, working with. But we realized when we took a ladder out there that that if we got just a couple feet higher, um, a little bit higher than the HOA would really allow the whole house to be, um, based on the height restrictions, we realized that there really was a great view. Um, and so this, this view frame was, uh, you can see during construction, this view frame, uh, because we were kind of working our way out of the site, um, had to be one of the first things that was built. And so, um, uh, they were in Indianapolis um, coming back and forth. So uh, one of the first times they came where there was much to see, it was at about this stage um, where it was mostly just the view portal up. And, um, and so throughout this whole process, um, uh, Mary had been very much engaged in all of the decision making. And, um, but Alan uh, was, he was interested, but he was still, he was, spending most of his time on, on his Blackberry during meetings and letting Mary make most of the decisions and things like that. Um, and so they came out for this, this, uh, this trip and um, went out to the view portal and Alan for the first time got really excited and he put down his Blackberry for a little while. So that was, that was a really, um, that was a, a great moment when he saw um, uh, what the house was going to start to be. So there it is. And then, um, so we don't get snow very often. Do you ever get snow here? Maybe just a little bit. So it's, it's we, we get it occasionally. And about, uh, was it about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, we had what is quite a bit of snow for us. And so um, I asked my dad and his wife who live very close to this project if they could run out and take some pictures of the snow. Um, so, um, thought I'd leave with that, with that photo, so, um, and then, but then a week later, it was 90 degrees, so, um, okay, pardon? Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for your attention and, and, uh, and for having us here. Uh, we, uh, typically close with this, just kind of recap, uh, idea of simple shelters, which, uh, of course, the last project was very far from a chicken coop, a very nice chicken coop, I guess. But um, it really, the, the thinking behind it is, is the same. It's just following the problem, solving the problem very directly, every decision being uh, about something important, uh, just being very considerate of the materials and the resources that are being consumed. Uh, and, in, and, and the site uh, is also a very important, critical part. Um, so just to kind of wrap this up, uh, we, we love to say that uh, we love buildings that speak of the people who, who built them and who love them. Simple shelters are 
made of simple materials but rich in space. Um, architecture that's connected, <coughs> connected to the land and connecting us all. And I wish that someday we could say that we've done anything with the qualities and beauty and meaning that's in the wall pictured in this image uh, uh, one of these days. Uh, but we clearly have a long way to go and uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep trying. Thanks for having us, appreciate it. So uh, just under an hour, any questions for us? Happy to answer. Criticisms? Yes? Did the pink in that house, the, the little secret that you had, was it Rosa Mexicano? It's uh, Bogambilia. Pero, uh, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a pink, it's called Tucson Pink. We almost went with that one. Because, uh, what is it, Don Edwards? Tucson Red. Tucson Tucson red. red. But it's a pink. It, it's a really nice color. Um, who's that, Don Edwards? Don Edwards, and I'm forgetting the name of the, forgetting the name of the color. It's just Helene. red. Oh, it's Helene. Oh, yeah. And I just, and that's why I remember that, because our, um, our Daughter. goddaughter is named Helene. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, well, not named after our goddaughter, but, uh, yeah, Helene. It was the Don Edwards color. In my uh, summer picture of what I got, right, this color. Right. He's a he's he's a he's a big influence on on us. Yeah, I mean you can tell in the Garcia the big window is all a rip off of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, uh, his ability to to take modern ideas and 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 Mexican culture and blend them in a in a very seamless way is something we we would like to be able to do. Do you have someone in the defined style? Do you find that your clients come to you with kind of more of a, okay, just tell me what you think, or are they very prescriptive, or is it like everyone else where you've got kind of a mixture of who's your ideal client and why? You know, we've had clients who are, like the Garcia residents, his uh, requests were, were very few. He said he wanted um, uh, a lot of glass. Uh, he, he just said that he liked the feeling of a loft. Um, and then when we started talking about colors, he said, oh, I like bright colors. And that was, that was about it. I mean, I, and then he said, you know, do what you would do if it was for yourselves. And then we've had other clients who are very, very engaged in decision making and have very, um, very specific um, requests. So I'd say the live-in residence was one where she was you know, very, very um, engaged in the decision making. And I would say, go ahead. No, everything in general, uh, there, what happens for us is um, the Garcia residence, he didn't, he was a bachelor, he didn't have any sense of anything and he just wanted it done. Um, but Mary came to us, uh, and this happens quite often, students, uh, clients come to us and they saw a project that they, they connected with, but they didn't like the block, or they didn't like the particular color, or the, or the window shapes, or whatever it is. And so they assume that that's what we're gonna do to their house. And so there is a little bit of like, well, I really love your work, but I don't wanna use block. And so Mary thought that, but she said, but I don't wanna get in your way. Do what you, do what you think, here's my opinion, and then go and see what happens. And so she was pretty certain that we were going to end up with block on her on her house, and of course that house it, it didn't make sense. Um, so uh, it really we try not to uh, to impose ourselves. I was talking to the students this afternoon or this morning, and how uh, really what we're aiming at is not expressing ourselves, but rather expressing the problem. So our job really is to understand the client as well as we possibly can, and to understand the site as well as we possibly can. Uh, so that the things are born out of those two things, uh, the site, the environment, the climate, the, the budget, the, everything else. So we actually impose ourselves quite much at the end. At least that's what we t tell ourselves. I mean, we're, we're in it the whole way and we're kind of making decisions, whether we realize it or not, that are skewing more to our, to our biases, but um, we're trying very hard to fight against that so that we end up with something that is appropriate. Um, not for our, not to our portfolio, but to our clients' needs and to the site's needs. 
I mean, hopefully at, at the end of that, if everything is, is based on something true, then it doesn't, it doesn't, we don't, that's why we try to avoid trendy work. Uh, and hopefully it, it'll ring true for forever, hopefully, or at least until the building falls apart. Hopefully it won't. I really appreciate the fact that you shared one of um, your growth opportunities that some people might call in there, but where you didn't necessarily win a competition. How, did your process evolve from that, your creative process? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it has in, in part because... I don't even remember. I think they were, they, just, they were growing, they grew, the one that I liked, and I think it won, uh, they were growing algae. Um, and so they had a, there was this big uh, towers of, of algae producing, um, to grow algae to produce en uh, energy and power, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, but uh, I guess the thing that, that these, those exercises, as, as we came to see them, uh, was that the, the designs for a museum, where a museum tries to be a non-space so that it can receive anything, and us saying that you know everything's born of the site, so you enter a space where the site is trying not to exist uh, by design. It was a, it was a challenge, and so we it challenged our our entire idea of this premise of, of the site being uh, a form giver or, or a design factor. So in in the in the first thing that we did for Smoka, all we really had we had a very limited budget, um, and then we had a a control joint cut into the slabs. And so we just built on that and, and so that was that. But um, it, uh, it has not changed, it has changed our, our, pro our process a little bit in that we realize we have to be more open and more flexible um, in how we approach design. And so, you know, sometimes you don't have a very strong site and so you do have to impose some of yourself a little bit, uh, which is a little bit of a contradiction. But it, it we, that we find imposing of ourselves, expressing ourselves is generally, that's in the absence of other information to design from. So, so it's been, yeah, it's good, been good in that sense. That it allows us a, another way to, to work it and, and the realization that sometimes it, we have to put of ourselves into a project more strongly if there isn't enough there to, to work with. Is there a question in the back? No, another question? What's your border on the project? Um, <coughs> It was. It was. There was actually um, a part of the exhibit was um, kind of as you came out of it, there was a whole board where people could um, kind of put their thoughts down. Um, and part of it was, you know, did this you know, change your ideas about, um, you know, what it means to be, um, you know, to be coming into this country or to, you know, all of all of those issues. And so, um, we did get a lot of um, positive feedback um, that was about people just thinking, thinking about things, um, rethinking, um, yeah, rethinking about their assumptions about you know what people were doing and why, and and um, it becoming more about um, an experience and being able to put themselves in somebody else's. Um, um, shoes, you know, on on both sides. So. Yeah. Yep. Now, now that you accentuated that, but I didn't see any of the uh, mechanical equipment anywhere around any of the projects. Where you guys, do you guys go to a uh, water tower type pulling system for your air conditioning, or do you think? I was not as a selective for photographing. Yeah. That was like, yeah. Good job. Um, <laughs> well, sort of. The, actually, the the last project. I shouldn't say this, but the, the mechanical system, because of how our buildings tend not to have backs, like they, we design every everything to be engaged with the landscape, and so that one was a very tricky one uh, because of the distance of the air conditioning system to the units itself. It was really tricky. We couldn't put anything on the roof, and we couldn't. Um, so the, where the end, the mechanical ended up is where it had to be, and it's not where I want it to be, but. Just that's where it had to be. So we we disguise it somewhere. So I don't know why they don't make a nicer mechanical unit, much more beautiful. I don't, everybody has them, so why would they make them much more elegant and beautiful? The ones these are actually not.
too ugly, but they they don't go with the house. So do you use water or do you use air? Right now we've used air mostly. Yeah, we haven't. We have. I'm interested in hearing from you what you can teach me about. Right. Yeah. No, we don't. The, the houses are actually our houses are fairly small, and our budgets are actually not that big. Uh, in Tucson, we build for our biggest uh, price per square foot has been slightly less than three hundred dollars. Uh, we've designed for 150, 175. Our, our mid range is like two hundred dollars per foot. For a, a house design, is, uh, I, I was just uh, talking with Eric, and you know, I hear Las Vegas is a lot more than that. Um, Phoenix is a lot more than that. Is that from beginning to end, including the interiors? Well, that's construction cost, so everything that is physically attached to the building. Yeah. The interior that are built in, the, the soft things that are movable, that those are not included in that. Uh, sometimes that includes a, the landscaping, like the $300 for what really does. Um, but, but it includes all the, all the cabinetry, cabinetry, the kitchens, the you know, bathrooms, all the, of that. The, the fixed, yeah. fixed mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Projects you showed are all, um, we're all very jealous of the sites. So how can you take these same ideas you have when you're dealing with uh, a landscape that have offers of use that you have and take a project in an urban environment? Yeah, yeah. One of, one of the things about today that I lament, but it was not, I just didn't want this to go too late, too long. Uh, we actually had, uh, several urban projects um, and they're on our website um, if you look up the green space work we'll be, we actually partnered with one of our clients a contractor that we did several houses with and we launched our own development company for, as, uh, for doing infill projects in the city and so that's what got us thinking about the city and so we've had a lot of conversations and discussions about what we could do better but our idea was to lead by example and so um, those projects are on very weird properties in the middle of the city, in, in the middle of uh, some challenging site, uh, challenging neighborhoods uh, from an economic standpoint. Uh, but we could see that there's qualities of being in there. So it, it's, they're, they're different, uh, but they still follow the same principles as our, our higher end work. Um, and we find something to look at. There's always something to, to focus on, something to uh, make them connect. They're always connected with the sun, Wind, water, um, client culture, all those things. Um, and then we've had some very big projects, uh, 280 uh, uh, unit of apartment complex uh, that we were going to show and then we decided not to. It just went, I thought it would go too long. Uh, and then a project in Phoenix, uh, actually Glendale, Arizona, where uh, it was a, a 10 acre development. It was kind of like, it was a 76 acre development that. Uh, we got the kind of the, the central park part of it, and so that, that was a well, that was kind of a fabricated urban context because there wasn't anything there, just farmland. So that was kind of cool. But, um, so we do have experience with it, we just didn't show it. Uh, not because it's not because we don't like it, it's just that for efficiency and time. But uh, we will invite you to check out our website, and, and all that stuff is there. Isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, most of it. Um, both, I guess there's, we've done, worked on three pretty big commercial, all developer driven projects. Um, uh, two of them are up, one is not yet, but um, they've all, uh, none of them have moved forward um, for different reasons, mostly economical kinds of reasons. So um, hopefully uh, one of these days one will actually move past uh, schematic design. Thank you. Thank you. So, before I, I bring Amy up, before she talks about tonight's program, I just I wanted to talk a little bit about the Design Center. I know a lot of folks here in Las Vegas aren't familiar with Las Vegas Design Center, which is 
the, the, the portion of World Market Center that's open year-round. Uh, it, it consists of the first two floors of Building A and the first floor of Building C, although most of the showrooms are migrating over to Building A, and it really serves as a year-round resource for local interior designers. Um, we, we have a variety of showrooms that offer everything from furniture, fabrics, lighting, floor coverings, wall decor, uh, decorative accessories. And those shows are open 10 to 5, Monday through Friday, um, and are available um, both to interior designers as well as the public. The public can come in and shop. And we have an on-site purchasing service, an interior design service that can assist consumers who aren't working with interior designers. So most of those showrooms, uh, most of their product um, is, is tailored specifically to interior designers. So, so they're used to selling to designers and, and, and architects and for smaller projects. You don't have to be a, a a big box retailer, you know, ordering container loads to, to shop for them. So, um, um, a couple of events we we have events on our calendar right now. We've got a few upcoming events this spring. Uh, make sure to visit our website, LasVegasDesignCenter.com, uh, for those events. We have a sample sale that will be held June 24th through the 29th. All the design center shows will be selling their samples off the floor at up to 60 to 75 percent off. So make sure you come back and, and see us for that if, if you're looking for anything particular. So um, that's pretty much all I have. Again, thank you all for, for joining us tonight, and I'll, I'll welcome Amy up to talk about the program. Thank you. Thank you, Kane, and um, thank you for having us here tonight. And um, This is really a treat to be at the, World, um, the Las Vegas Design Center at World Market. Um, my name is Amy Fincham, and I'm with Colab Las Vegas. Um, this lecture tonight is part of a seven-speaker series, and this is lecture number four. Um, Colab Las Vegas was started April 5th of last year, so we're just four days away from our one-year anniversary. Um, and it's been pretty amazing to be able to do so much in our first year, so I just want to take a moment tonight and kind of um, honor uh, making it through our very first year. Um, I see Quentin here tonight, and, and really, um, along with Quentin and some other folks, really allowed us to get off the ground. Um, it was last year in December where, it, when on several occasions, we were talking to Quentin and Carol, and, and I was telling them about this vision that I had to open up a gallery space, and it took them a couple times saying, you know, we have this space you could use before it really sunk in that I was being offered a space to use. So. <laughs> Um, you know, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be able to really get uh, up, up and off the ground and show those first shows that would allow us to open up a more permanent space at Art Square. So, I um, also want to thank um, Craig Palacios and Kelly Bennett and um, uh, Michelle, Michelle DeMario and uh, Heather Soto and Kirsten Clark and Tyler Schaefer um, and Zach Ostrowski. Those folks uh, met with me when the vision was first in place and really helped refine that mission statement and that vision statement and get it brand new for the organization. Um, so um, we have um, some of our sponsors here tonight. Jill Abelman with Inside Style. Thank you, Jill. And uh, Sean Coulter. I believe I saw him in the back there. Um, Chris Atasiano, if, if you're here and I just didn't see you, if you just raise your hand, that would be great. Um, Craig Lilati, Stephen Quartz with Halcro Yules, um, TJK Consulting, Sage Design Studios, Audio Visual Warehouse, Innovative Consulting, our 2002 Young Guns, um, Forte Specialty Contractors, Wright Engineers, Superlight, Barker Drotter Associates, Assemblage Studio, Tau Studios, Mendenhall Smith Structural Engineers, um, the City of Las Vegas, and uh, the Las Vegas Design Center. And I'd also like to thank Laura and Enrique, um, our cameramen tonight. They have offered to uh, record all of our lecture series as well as our panel discussions, so those are available online. So we've got a couple of those up on our website if you did miss uh, the first couple lectures. I'd also like to thank Eric Strain for his hard work in helping to put this lecture series together. 